What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be tackling a German Pilsner. This is going to be a little bit different than your typical German Pilsner though and very different from the one I brewed last year. So stick around and see how we do this one. So it is the middle of summer right now. It is absurdly hot and humid. I think it's about 90 degrees outside right now, which is hot for a New Englander. So bear with me Texans. I know it's much worse where you come from, but you're gonna have to give me this one. Anyway, today we're gonna be brewing a beer that is perfect for summer weather like this. You'll be able to brew this on Monday and serve it on Friday. So we are gonna be tackling a German Pilsner and instead of using a traditional German yeast, we're gonna be using Lutra Kvaik. Lutra is a special strain of Kvaik. It is actually an isolate of the Hornendahl blend. So what happened was the very knowledgeable people over at Omega Yeast Labs were able to take this uh, blend of cultures known as Hornendahl. They were able to isolate one specific strain of yeast out of that entire blend, which is remarkably clean fermenting even at high temperatures in excess of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is what became Lutra. Lutra is available as a dry yeast as well as a liquid yeast, which is pretty awesome. So you get to have the best of both worlds here. And it's really well known for just being an exceptionally clean fermenter, no matter the temperature. So you can ferment this anywhere basically above 75 degrees all the way up to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and you will get the same results, extra extra clean fermentation, very fast fermentation, um, and it is a worthy replacement for a dry fermenting lager yeast like W3470 uh, or Y2124. It's not gonna leave behind the same amount of residual sugar and uh, different like sulfur notes that you might get out of certain lager yeasts, so it's not exactly a perfect replacement for every single one, but if you are looking for something a little bit more malty, something more like a Vienna lager, a Bach, something like that that has that residual sugar, you might not wanna use Lutra, you might wanna use a different yeast. However, in my experience with it, it ferments beautifully and uh, leaves absolutely no yeast character behind. Uh, I used it last year in an American light lager, so even though it was a very low ABV beer, a very light flavored beer, you could not pick up any yeast character whatsoever on it. So I was pretty happy with that. We're gonna be doing something very similar to the pseudo lager I just made with Scar, which I'm actually drinking out of this glass here. I'm hoping to see if I could pick up any sort of differences between Lutra and Scar uh, and see if there's really any reason to use one over the other. However, this is a hoppy pseudo lager and what we're brewing is a pseudo German Pilsner, a little bit different of a beer, um, but it should still work. Without further ado, let's go ahead and thank our sponsors and then we'll jump into the recipe. So first of all, Northern Brewer, they have all the ingredients that you need to make this batch of beer as well as any other that you want to. So a big thank you to them for supplying those ingredients. You can find Lutra on their website without a problem. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, they are the manufacturers of the system that I brew on and have brewed on for about the last two years. It is a fantastic system. I'm actually brewing with this one outside today. I ran the extension cord out of the uh, basement so that we're gonna be enjoying the nice weather. So let's go over our recipe. Again, this is a smash beer, very simple recipe, just the same way I've been doing it for all of these Kvike beers. It's gonna be 10 and a half pounds of Weirman Bohemian Pilsner. This is not the floor malted Bohemian Pilsner malt that I used in this brew here. It is just regular Bohemian Pilsner malt. The reason for that is I don't really feel like doing a step mash. I think I just wanna do a regular single infusion mash on this one to expedite the brewing process. For our hops, we're gonna be using all Hallertau Tradition. Hallertau Tradition is very similar to Hallertau Tau Mittelfruer. It's uh, just basically a slightly stronger version of it. It uh, allows you to use less hops in the brew day, but give the same results as you would get with something like Mittelfruer. When you order Hallertau that has no additional name to it, if it's got an alpha acid higher than like 3%, then it's probably tradition. If it's got a low alpha acid, it's probably gonna be regular Mittelfruer. We're gonna be doing a pretty traditional Pilsner hop schedule on this one with a little bit more hops because I just wanted that in the beer. So we're gonna do a half ounce of Hallertau tradition at first word hops. That's gonna go in basically after we finish laudering and as we are heating up to the boil, this provides a really nice gentle bitterness that I find works very, very well in Pilsners of all kinds. Then we're gonna add one ounce of Hallertau tradition at 60 minutes. We're gonna add one ounce of it at 10 minutes and then we're gonna add one and a half ounces at zero minutes. For our water profile on this one, I'm doing the same exact thing that I did on this beer that worked out really, really well for a Pilsner. Super clean, nice, snappy bitterness. I am gonna be using eight gallons of spring water and adding absolutely nothing to it. I'm using Poland spring water if you want to exactly copy this recipe uh, for what it is. If you have any kind of spring water that has low minerality in it and maybe a little bit of hardness, then you're gonna be good to go for this one. Just keep an eye on your pH uh, and make sure that you adjust it accordingly as you need to. Our yeast is gonna be Lutra Kvike, as I mentioned earlier. We're gonna be using one packet of dried Lutra Kvike and pitching it about 85 degrees and fermenting it about the same. 
for our mash on this one lastly it's very simple we are just going to do one 90 minute rest at 148 degrees fahrenheit a lot of people ask me why i mash for so long it's because i do a full volume mash with all of the water in there that i need for the entire brew day it takes a long time for all the enzymes to move around and convert all the sugars available in that much volume so that's why i do a bit of a longer rest on those also the lower mash temperature means there's a little bit less enzyme activity than if i mashed at say 152. so without further ado let's go ahead and jump into the brew day I added 8 gallons of spring water to my 10 gallon claw hammer supply 240 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature of 148. I also milled my grain at this time. Once the water had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in and started to recirculate the mash. After 10 minutes, I took a pH reading and I saw a mash pH of 5.44, which was pretty much right on target for me. So I carried on with no pH adjustments. Once the mash had rested for a total of 90 minutes, I raised it up to the mash out step of 170 Fahrenheit and let it rest for 15 more minutes. Then I pulled out the grain basket and as I let the grain basket drain for about 15 minutes, I added my first wort hops, which was half an ounce of Halatau tradition. I also set the controller to maintain a temperature just below boiling so that we did not have a boil over as we were waiting for our basket to drain. Once the basket had finished draining, I removed it and then I set the controller to about 50% power to maintain a good rolling boil. At this time, I added my 60 minute addition, which was one ounce of Halatau Tradition. I let the boil continue for 50 more minutes, adding my 10 minute hop addition, which was one ounce of Halatau Tradition, a World Flock tablet, and yeast nutrient. <music> 10 minutes later, I ended the boil and added 1.5 ounces of Halatau Tradition at zero minutes. Then I began to chill down to the pitching temp of about 85 Fahrenheit and transferred into the fermenter. I took an OG sample using the EC Dents and I saw an original gravity of 1052. At this point, I pitched one packet of Lutrikovike into the Spike C of 5 and I left it to ferment. So now we'll talk about the fermentation of this beer. Very simple, very straightforward. Lutra makes this so easy. Lagers are sometimes pretty difficult to do, especially if you're working at lager temperatures with a dedicated lager yeast. But when you're using Lutra and making a pseudo lager out of it, it just cuts the effort in half and it cuts the time down by maybe 90%. So we actually are gonna end up having a full finished beer ready to drink within the week which is pretty awesome. Uh, whereas a traditional lager, especially like a Pilsner, is gonna take some time. Usually you're gonna ferment that one down about two or three weeks worth of fermentation. Then you're gonna lager it, actually, uh, for a long period of time, usually one to two months, unless you're using cold side findings to kind of help aid up the clarification process. But even then, you're never really gonna get true crispy lager character unless you actually do lager it. Uh, that's the only way to get the crispiness that you're all looking for. Even when you're speeding things along, even when you're using Kvike, it's not gonna truly be lager crisp until it's been in the keg sitting there at cold temperatures for a long time. So just keep that in mind. That being said, you're gonna get a 99% solution after about a couple weeks. So it's all up to you as to how much you wanna wait, 
how much you care about that sort of character, um, and whether you're entering it into a competition. But to ferment this beer, it is really simple. All we're doing is pitching it nice and hot, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. We have a decent amount of nutrients in there, just about double the amount of nutrients that you would add to a normal batch of beer with Kvike. Kvike depends very much so on nutrient from a high gravity wort, so when you pitch it into a low gravity wort, it doesn't always have all of the tools that it needs in order to ferment successfully, so adding nutrients is really a generally good thing to do for low gravity fermentations. We're gonna pitch it at 85, but we're gonna get a heat pad on the fermenter and we're gonna get it all the way up to about 100 degrees. Again, if you're anywhere between 75 and 100, you're gonna be fine. Uh, it's gonna give you the same character, but I want this to rush through fermentation as fast as possible, so we're gonna crank it all the way up to 100 and we're gonna let it ride. Should only take about three days. Once it's finished the fermentation, I'll transfer into a keg and I'll go ahead and put that on gas, force carbonate it up, add some cold side findings and hope that it's clear by the end of the week. It may not be, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Alternatively, of course, you can use a different yeast for this fermentation. You can use a traditional lager yeast and do a traditional lager fermentation. That is absolutely a-okay. This recipe is set up so that you can do that. And like I said before, it's not gonna work the same way as Kvike. You can also use a neutral ale yeast, like USO5, for example, when fermented at the proper temperatures, is gonna give you a relatively clean beer. I wouldn't recommend it if you have Kvike on hand because it's just gonna be that much easier to use Kvike. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is an option. You can ferment this beer with a lager yeast under pressure though. So if you don't wanna go through the traditional lager fermentation, you can go ahead, pitch a lager yeast into this thing and then apply about 10 to 15 PSI of pressure. This is gonna result in a beer that ferments a lot faster, uh, especially you get the higher temperature that you're fermenting it under. The pressure helps neutralize some of those harsh off flavors and gives you a much cleaner beer at the end of the day. And it's still technically a lager. So in a nutshell, this is what we're doing. We're pitching our Kvike at 85 degrees, fermenting at about 100 degrees for about three to five days. And we'll transfer into a keg, we'll put it on gas, we'll get it ready, carved up, and uh, hopefully you can serve it within the week. So anyway, catch you guys in a few days. Cheers. Fermentation was unsurprisingly very quick. I saw a final gravity of 1011 on day three. But just to be sure, I left it in the fermenter for two more days to clean itself up, improve its flavors, and just to be sure fermentation had truly finished. I kegged it on day five, adding biofine and force carbonating, and I had it pouring clean and clear within a week. All right guys, so here's the deal. I went to pour this beer as I was getting ready to shoot the tasting segment here, and this happened. Yeah, that's right. I kicked the keg as soon as I was going to taste the beer for YouTube. Now, I really like that beer a lot, and instead of just telling you guys what I thought about it in the past, I figured you guys deserve to see what it actually looks like coming out of the faucet, so I went ahead and completely rebrewed it entirely. I made a few tweaks, which we'll talk about in a second here, but uh, I think it's 100% worth it because the end result was awesome. The beer is called Basic Beach Lager, and it comes in at 5.5% ABV and 42 IBUs. So for the appearance of the beer, it is an absolutely crystal clear, nice gold color. You can really see the bubbles rising up through the glass. I love pouring a Pilsner in a proper Pilsner glass for that reason. It is beautiful. It's a really nice white head. Uh, it does actually stick around for a good period of time. Uh, nice fine bubbles on it, good lacing, uh, and overall just a very pleasing appearance. It looks exactly like a German Pilsner might. Uh, I do think the addition of the Bohemian Pilsner malt as opposed to the regular Pilsner malt led to a little bit darker of a color, um, but that's actually not a bad thing. I do like a nice golden Pilsner. So now let's go in for aroma.
Aroma on this beer is actually really nice. It's, it's quite aromatic. It has a really nice, uh, just sweet crackery kind of Pilsner character to it with a little bit of honey as well. Um, and also there is a very nice floral component and herbal component coming from the Halitau. Overall, very aromatic, very inviting aroma. So let's go ahead and actually accept that invitation and go in for the mouthfeel. Hmm. Wow, yeah. Mouthfeel in this one is a nice medium light character. Um, it's not as dry as perhaps like some of the Belgians that I've been making, um, but it's on point for a Pilsner. It's crisp. It has been sitting in the keg, lagering for a little while at about 34 degrees Fahrenheit, which is enough to get that nice edge of crispness on there, that nice kind of um, snappiness to it. It has a little bit of a residual sweetness on the mouthfeel, so that way uh, it's not exactly super dry, but we'll talk about that more in the flavor section. A really nice carbonation level on this one. Uh, it tickles your tongue as the carbonation comes out. You can still see all those bubbles rising up through the beer. It's like one of my favorite things. <laughs> Overall, very easy to drink, very, very consumable uh, beer with a lot of flavor in it. So yeah, on that note, let's go in for flavor. Mm. This continues to get better and better and better as it sits in the keg. This is an excellent German Pilsner. While it is not truly a Pilsner, it is a pseudo lager. I will give you that. I pissed a lot of people off last time I said lager and I was talking about Kvike. Yes, you're correct, it's a pseudo lager, but the style is in the style of a Pilsner. That being said, this is a very, very good beer. It has so much expression of hop character, especially those noble hops in there. Uh, it is it, this really, really nice crispness to it as well, along with a ton of wonderful, lovely, honey-like, hay-like, crackery-like Pilsner character, specifically Pilsner malt character. It is so good. The other thing too is there is a really, really nice snappy bitterness to this. It is an appropriately bitter character for a Pilsner. It's not quite West Coast IPA level of bitterness, but it is snappy, it is there, it is assertive, but it's not overdone, it's not overpowering. It's just enough to let you know that this is not your ordinary multi lager and it really expresses the noble hop character very nicely. It balances out the sweetness of the Pilsner malt quite nicely too. Um, and I'd say it, it does really feel like a traditional Pilsner. And then once that bitterness goes away, you're left with a really nice, satisfying hop and malt flavor together that is uh, really just quite pleasant and quite refreshing this time of year. Coming in at five and a half percent, it is a really, really good beer to beat this summer heat with. Very nice, subtle sweetness on the very end of it as well. Has a good residual honey-like character um, that really, really complements these traditional noble hops so well. Those noble hops are coming through with a really nice herbal character um, and a really, really spicy bouquet as well. Not as spicy as Saz, a little bit different than Saz. Saz is a little bit more of a spicy herbal, it's a bit more of an herbal flowery kind of character. There's a tiny bit of citrusy earthiness in this, um, which I believe is coming from the Lutra. Now, when I specifically mentioned that I was brewing a German Pilsner with Lutra a couple weeks back when I was actually making this, um, I may have upset a particular individual over not using proper German lager yeast for this one. And well, the whole point of this experiment is two things. First of all, how close can we get to a true German lager ex experience, if you will, with a Kvike yeast? And secondly, how does this compare to the Scar Kvike that I used earlier? Um, and I think the answer to that question is, it is very, very close. There is a little tinge of something in there, a little citrus character that is not present if you're using a traditional German lager yeast. And that's kind of the whole point of that citrus character, right? This is a wee bit lemony. Um, it's not really apparent unless you're really looking for it. The first batch of this beer came out extra lemony because my pH was off. I adjusted my mash pH a little bit higher in the rebrew and the pH drop got compensated for and therefore we actually nailed the proper final pH in the beer. However, if I had fermented this with a traditional German lager yeast and you followed a lager fermentation schedule, I wouldn't have had that issue. With the pH drop compensated for, this is now so freaking close to a proper German Pilsner. It is almost indistinguishable if you're not looking for that little bit of lemon. Regarding Scar versus Lutra, it's hard to tell because both of them produced excellent pseudo lagers and both of them produce crispy pseudo lagers. 
both of them got pretty much out of the way entirely in flavor, but when it really comes down to it, I didn't get as much of that pH drop and as much of that citrus lemony kind of bite uh, with the Scar than I did with Elutra. So I'm gonna have to hand it to Scar, uh, I think in a very, very, very close comparison. Lutra is gonna be just as good for pretty much every application, and Lutra wins a lot in terms of being much more accessible, as well as also being in a dry yeast form, um, which is honestly a very, very good thing. But now let's talk about those little potential improvements on the initial batch, the initial recipe that I made in this second beer in this rebrew. The first thing was dialing back my late boil hops. Um, so I initially had an ounce and a half of Hallowtown Tradition going in at zero minutes, and I changed that down to about one ounce. I also dialed back my 10 minute addition, cut that in half as well, and that actually produced a far more balanced beer. My initial beer, not only was it lemony, but it was also a little bit too much of that noble hop character, and it was a little overpowering, especially combined with that lemon. So I wanted to dial that back, and that ended up actually producing a much, much better beer. So that is my potential improvement recommendation. The second thing is adding in something called Clarity Firm, uh, which is the only change that I made in terms of clarifying agents. Um, I added World Flock, I added Clarity Firm, and I added Biofine to this keg in order to try and clear it up. It worked out within about 24 hours. I had a very clear beer. It's been clear like this for a while. In my initial batch, I actually only added the World Flock and the Biofine. I didn't add the Clarity Firm. I had a lot of chill haze because you're not bringing it down below you know, 100 degrees usually when you pitch, so that really does affect your chill haze production. Um, Clarity Firm is an enzyme made by White Labs that cuts down on chill haze and also removes most of the gluten from your beer, so it is a little bit more gluten reduced, if you will. So I think that might be the magic combo for getting a really, really clear beer with Kvike. I oftentimes do have that chill haze in my Kvike beers because I am pitching so hot. I'm not chilling so fast. So at the end of the day, this turned out to be a very good beer. I'm very happy with it. And um, yeah, this is gonna be continued to enjoy throughout the month of August, throughout September as well. I understand that brewing German lagers the proper way can be a bit of a touchy subject. I just wanna show that it's entirely possible to make a Pilsner-esque beer that is extremely close to the real thing using a non-Pilsner yeast. And I'm not trying to say this is in any way better than doing it the old fashioned way, but it gets you pretty close. I took a little bit of a production break over the last couple weeks, but I am very excited to be back and I got plenty of exciting stuff lined up for you guys over the next several months. So I hope you keep watching and enjoy the channel. If you haven't done so already, please hit that like and subscribe button and comment down below. I want to know your thoughts on this sort of thing. I love discussing the aspects of brewing and beer with everybody. Um, and you know, everyone's got some unique thoughts about this. If you want to support the channel, please go ahead, check out the multiple options you have to support me. There's a t-shirt store where you can get t-shirts like this one. Uh, that's going to be in the Teespring store down below the description box. You can also check out my Patreon, my Amazon store, as well as channel memberships. And if you do feel inclined, the super thanks button is also a great way to support me very quickly and easily. I appreciate all of it. You guys really do mean the world to me, especially if you're still watching, because if you're making it all the way to the very end of the video, you're a real fan and I appreciate you. So until the next one, cheers.